Today, what I want to talk about is the spiritual practice of silence. The spiritual practice of silence. So there's going to be a, a number of elements, uh, a, a part of today's sermon that may be different than what you normally do. Not many, and don't be scared or leave. Um, but just just practicing this idea of, uh, of silence. So in the student ministry, we're dealing with this idea of practicing the way of Jesus. Um, and so for the last six weeks, we focused on spending time with Jesus so that who you spend time with is who you become uh, and become like them so that we can ultimately do what Jesus did. And so uh, today we're taking one of those ideas of silence and, and looking at what does it look like to practice um, the spiritual ancient practice of being silent before the Lord? Um, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7 where he says uh, that there's two different types of people in the world, those that put his word into practice and then those that don't. And he's talking about the two houses, one that uh, endures a storm and the other one that endures the same storm. One stands, one doesn't. And he says the one who puts my word into practice experiences the, the added benefit that comes with following him and actually putting those things into practice, that house stands. And the other one who doesn't put that word into practice, who doesn't follow him in that way, doesn't experience that same benefit. And so as, as students, as a church, we want to experience the benefit of what it looks like to experience the fullness of what uh, Jesus provides for us and offers us. And so this is why we want to practice his word. And so that's why we're teaching on this today. So very short teaching text in Luke 5, uh, Luke 5, 16. This is what um, Luke writes about Jesus. It says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This is the word of the Lord. My family, like many of you maybe, uh, has been without power for about four days, three days, something like that. Our, our power went out on Thursday. And um, at the beginning of it, the absence of power was, is actually kind of fun. Uh, it's like a new thing that we're kind of figuring out together. But the longer we were without power, the more our house became like the time of the judges. And it was like, everybody just does what's right in their own eyes. Like, my son wants, you know, fruit. I'm like, we don't have any fruit, okay? We got, we got Skittles. This is close enough. Take some Skittles. Ice cream at every meal. It's going to melt. Eat your ice cream. Just scrounging around, living life and trying to understand. We just we can't wash clothes or dishes, so stuff's just everywhere. Um, but it was fun. But it, it, there are parts of it that were interesting because what we realized as a family were the things that we actually cared about. In the absence of power, what we realized was like, here is the like, bare minimum for Colton, for Rainy, my wife, and Teddy, my son. For me, it's coffee. I just need coffee. I could, if I could freeze it, I could probably eat it. I could live on coffee. I just need it in the morning. And so we have a gas fireplace. Don't need electricity for that. And I'm cooking my coffee like over my gas fireplace in the morning. And I did that this morning at like 6 a.m. And it's not as good, but it's necessary. And, um, and so for my wife, it's hot water. She wants a hot bath, a hot shower, something. And so reaching out to friends around the neighborhood and saying, what are you doing? We miss you. Also, can I use your shower? Um, it's always an awkward conversation because we really know what we're trying to get to. Um, but for my son, for Teddy, um, honestly, it's TV and iPad. So as soon as he realized the Wi-Fi was out, he's like, deuces, I'm going to uh, go to stay at grandparents' house because they have internet and Wi-Fi. And so he bailed and left us on Friday. But um, Anyways, in the absence of power, what was revealed was actually what really matters to us. And I think this is true in many ways. I think there are so many things that we can learn from being in the presence of something. But then there are just alternative things that we learn by the absence of those things. So for instance, you may be a patient and reasonable person and really believe that that's who you are. But in the absence of food, when you're hungry, you become hangry. And in that particular scenario, you find out how patient and how reasonable you actually are because there's something that you're missing that you need. In the absence of supervision, our, our kids uh, are normally pretty good under, under supervision. Um, maybe yours aren't, whether they're supervised or not. But in the absence of supervision, what's actually revealed is our character. And so anybody can be a good kid when the, the parents are around and doing that thing. But when they're gone, those boundary lines seem to get crossed. The same works with employees. It's easy to be a really good employee when your boss is hovering over you or checking your work or there's some accountability there. But in the absence of their presence, what's revealed is who you actually are because they're not there to tell you who you need to be. And the same is true with substances. The absence of a substance that ultimately leads to withdrawals 
tells a person and reveals to a person who says they don't have a problem, hey, you actually do have a problem. And those are things that you wouldn't really experience if you were in the presence of those things. But the absence, the missing piece of that, does more to reveal things in us than what we would experience otherwise. And the same is true with noise and sound. We can learn a lot from the presence of noise and sound, but there are just certain things that you can only learn in silence. Just certain things that, that silence does for us that noise and sound cannot actively do in our lives. And this is why there's this ancient historic practice of pursuing solitude and pursuing silence and actually doing that. And so this is what this is. The, the spiritual practice of silence uh, is intentionally pursuing silence on your own, free from stimulation of people and technology, in order to listen to God, to hear from God, and to pray and keep the company of Jesus. And so what I want to do today is talk about that and talk about, our one, our desperate need for it and what it can do for us, but what silence ultimately does for us that we really actually need. And so three things, and then a short practice I just want to give you uh, that you could practice on your own. So the first is that uh, one of the things that silence does is that silence reveals hidden things inside of us, reveals hidden things inside of us. If you're a parent, You've probably experienced this. If you have kids that drive, uh, if you've ever texted them and they didn't respond, if you're like, where are you, how are you, and they don't respond, you text them again, no response, not even the little blue, the little bubbles that pop up. So you get a little worried, and so now you're, you're calling them, trying to get them on the phone, then you go to Life360, or you're tracking them on your phone, trying to figure out where they're at. But if they don't respond to text after text and call after call, your gut reaction isn't to go, everything's completely fine. I bet everything's great. No. Your gut reaction is to be like, they're dead and they're in a ditch somewhere. Like That's the, the normal thing that comes up in the silence. And what the silence is doing is not necessarily creating the fear. It's just releasing the fear. Their non-responsiveness, the silence from their end, makes you go like, oh, what has happened? Why are they not responding? And all of a sudden, what's revealed are a bunch of different fears and things that we have. If you've ever been on a first date or maybe you were courting someone or something like that and um, you share something vulnerable with them about like, like maybe you say through text message like, hey, I think I'm starting to like you or hey, I think I'm starting to fall in love with you. Uh, if they don't respond right away, if you don't even get the little blue bubbles or worse, you get the little bubbles that pop up and then they leave and they don't say, they're like, tch, tch, and then it goes away and you're like, oh no. Like, what, what, what pops into your mind is not like, they love me too. No. What pops into your mind is like, I scared them away. This was too soon. I did too much. Oh, my gosh. Like, should I send, like, an emoji face or, like, a JK? Just kidding. Like, what should I do to repair this situation? Because they clearly think I'm a psychopath. That's what happens in the silence. If they would respond, you would know how they feel. It would reveal their feelings. But in the silence, it reveals all the deep-seated insecurities that you have in and of yourself. Again, it doesn't create them. Those things are there. But in the silence, those things are revealed. This happens when you know something's wrong with your health, and you go to the doctor, and the time that you have to wait between the scan and the diagnosis, that, that, that piece of time you're going, I, don't know, I know something's wrong, but I'm not sure what it is, and you're waiting, that silent waiting where there's been no response, and you're, did they call today? No, they didn't call today. Did you get anything today? No, they didn't. What happens in that moment, in, the, in that time, is just all of these fears that come up. What could it be? What's, what, what's wrong? What's, what could be the thing? And it may be nothing. But what's revealed in that time is that all the things that you have. You start thinking about things that you tried to distract yourself from. Because you're like, I can't think about this stuff. It's the silence that's excruciating, but it's the silence that ultimately actually reveals those things. And so when we think of silence and, and think of it in that way... Again, it's not creating those feelings. It's not creating those fears. It's just opening up the lid so that those things can actually surface. And this is why we normally try to distract ourselves from those things. And this is also why uh, clinical psychologists would say that um, most anxiety peaks at night. Because it's the first time that all the distractions are gone. There's nothing, nobody texting you, nobody calling you, nothing to look at, nothing to do. And then uh, clinical psychologists... Um, What's his name? Uh, Bruce. Uh, Michael Bruce says that it's the first time that you're alone with your thoughts. And there's no distractions. There's no way to shove those things down. And so in that particular place, all of the thoughts come up and all of those things come into your mind. 
And so when you think of, 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 of silence in that way and that it allows those things to come up, you could, you could really sign up for, well, why should I ever pursue silence? Because when I do, if those things come into my mind, why should I allow silence to bring those things into my mind? Why not just distract them? And the truth is, is because distraction doesn't deal with those things. It just shoves them down. Distraction isn't the same as deliverance from those things. Distraction just makes you not think about them. It doesn't make them go away. Distracting ourselves from those things doesn't actually remove them. It just makes us not think about them. And this is why the scriptures call us to actually practice silence. The idea isn't to distract ourselves from them, but to actually allow them to come up. And as they're coming up into our brains and surfacing in our hearts and in our minds, to just continue the upward angle to the Lord and go, I'm going to cast all of my cares and all of my burdens on you because you care for me. So the idea that silence allows those things to go forward and to, and to come up and to, to surface in us is actually something that the Lord wants for us. Not so that we're riddled with them, but so that we can be delivered from those things. So that we can actually experience what David talks about when he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all of my fears. Not the problems. The problems are still there, but he delivered me from the fears of those problems. And that's what's available to us in silence. That when those things surface, that we can seek the Lord's presence and go, hey, I'm going to give these things to you because they're too heavy for me. I don't like these feelings. I don't like that when I'm silent, that all of a sudden I start worrying about things and I start dealing with my own agenda and, and thinking about deadlines. I don't like to do those things. And yet that's the point where you're supposed to let them lift up and then ultimately you're giving them to him. Your distractions or your, the things that disturb your mind ultimately become prayers and intercession for you that the Lord actually wants to do work in your life. And that's the beauty of silence. It allows those things to come up so that you can ultimately give them to him. So the second thing that silence does, silence helps us hear quiet things. This makes sense. Um, Barbara Brown Taylor uh, um, author that my wife introduced me to, uh, in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, shares her experience um, in a cave where she encountered complete silence. And this is what she writes. She says, all I could hear was nothing. I listened to the nothing for so long until I could finally hear something that sounded like the hum of a high voltage wire. Since there was no wire for miles around, the sound was obviously coming from inside of me. Years later, I would hear the American composer John Cage describe the same thing. He once isolated himself in a soundproof chamber so he could experience true and complete silence. But instead, he noticed two distinct sounds in the room, one high and one low. And he asked the sound technician what they were, and the technician told him the higher one was his nervous system and the lower one was his blood circulation. And she continues, I had never heard my life before, but that was what it was. It was the sound of my life and the silence. To be so quiet that you can hear your blood circulating in your veins, it's a really strange thing, but it's something that's so quiet that you would never hear unless you were in pure silence. And you would hear your nervous system, and then you would also hear your blood circulating through your veins. It's a very quiet thing, but silence allows for quiet things to be heard. And Richard Foster would say that this is why Jesus pursued silence and would often do this, not just once, but often pursue solitude and silence to spend time with his father because he wanted to hear the still, quiet voice of his father. And he gives a number of examples. Richard Foster writes, he says, Jesus inaugurated his ministry by spending 40 days alone in the desert. Before he chose the 12, he spent the entire night alone in the desert hills. When he received the news of John the Baptist's death, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place apart. After the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, Jesus went up into the hills by himself. Following a long night of work, in the morning, a great while before day, he rose and went out to a lonely place. When the twelve returned from a preaching and healing mission, Jesus instructed them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place. Following the healing of the leper, Jesus withdrew to the wilderness and prayed. And with three disciples, he sought the silence of a lonely mountain at the stage for the transfiguration. And as he prepared for his highest and most holy work on the cross, Jesus sought the solitude and silence of the Garden of Gethsemane to hear the quiet, still voice of his father. Because he had a question about, is there any other way, or is this, is this the cup that I have to drink? And I want to hear the still, quiet voice of my Father guiding me forward and giving me the confidence to move forward in that. Jesus wanted to hear the still, quiet voice of his Father. And God just chooses to predominantly speak with a still, small voice. 
in 1 Kings 19, where Elijah's standing you know, in the cave, and the Lord calls him out in the cave, and he hears he, all of these things that are really, really loud, windstorms and all the rest of it, and then all of a sudden there's a still whisper of a voice, and God speaks. Psalm 19 talks about this idea where the heavens declare the glory of God, their voice goes out into all the earth but no, with no sound. No one can hear it, but yet it goes forward fully and is declared from the heavens. God predominantly chooses to speak in a still small voice when he could. I mean, he could shout everything down and he could be very, very loud. The issue is, is that that's not what he wants. He chooses to speak in a still small voice because he actually wants those who are interested in hearing his voice, he wants them to draw near to him. And if he speaks quietly, the drawing near is so necessary. And this is what he wants. I mean, think about if somebody's whispering to you. What you have to do in that moment is you have to shut everything else down. You have to turn, you have to mute TVs if they're whispering. You have to, you know, tell everybody else to be quiet. And sometimes if they're whispering to you, you have to get so close to their mouth that you can hear it in your ear. And that's the idea that God has here. Why would he ever shout to you so that you could hear him from afar when the relationship he wants with you is that close? So close that you'd have to be close enough to hear him whisper. This is what he wants from you. We actually see this in the scriptures. God is constantly wanting to be near us in the garden, uh, in, the, in the tabernacle, and then in the temple. And then you have Jesus, who is God with us, coming to earth to be with us. And you have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, so he's with us always. And then in the end of the age, we're with him in person forever in his presence. He's kind of obsessed with us. He wants to be with us. He has testified to that in the scriptures. He just likes us and wants to be near us. And so when he speaks, he speaks in a still, small voice so that when we pursue him, we have the relationship with him that he desires, a very, very close one. And so, if you long to hear his voice, which I know many of you do long to hear his voice, there's a practice of silence, of sitting before the Lord and just asking, Let me, I, Lord, I want to hear, like Samuel, Lord, I, I, here I am, I'm your servant. Speak, your servant is listening. If you want to hear the still, quiet voice of the Father, we have to embrace the practice of silence. Henry Nouwen and Thomas Akempis uh, basically say the same thing, but Henry Nouwen says this. He says, without silence and solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. It begins with a time and place for God and for him alone. And if we really believe not only that God exists, but also that he is actively present in our lives, healing, teaching, and guiding, we need to set aside a time and space to give him our undivided attention. And then Thomas Akempis says this, In quiet and in silence, the faithful soul makes progress, for the hidden meanings of the scriptures become clear. And as one learns to grow still, one draws closer to the creator and further from the hurly-burly of the world. If you want to hear God speak, you have to pursue silence. Third, silence reminds us of the beauty of the gospel. Silence reminds us of the beauty of the gospel. I want to practice in integrated learning very quickly. It doesn't require a lot of you, uh, a lot from you to do anything. But as we talk through this point, I want us to integrate practicing a posture of sitting still, doing nothing, and not talking um, with the point itself. So if you can just humor me and do me a favor. You don't have to. It's a, it's a get to, not a have to. I'm not forcing you to do this. We don't have deacons around that are going to be checking the room. But do me the favor, just in your chair... Find a comfortable position in your chair. You're already sitting down. You're already doing great. Find a comfortable position. Maybe put everything out of your hands and just set your hands on your lap. They don't have to be up or down. Just If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, I encourage you to do that. We're going to dim the lights just a little bit. But what you're seeking to do is to take the posture of being in silence and just listening, doing nothing with your hands, Nothing with your mouth, just sitting in silence. Silence reminds us of the beauty of the gospel. When you sit like this, doing nothing before the Lord, no work, no words, no nothing. When you do this, you're reminded that this is how your salvation was bought. This is what you did to earn your salvation, absolutely nothing. You did nothing while he did everything. When you sit like this before the Lord, 
you reminded that you were not saved by the work of your hands, but by the nails in his. When you're silent before the Lord, you're reminded that you were not saved by your words, but by his words that said, it is finished. In the silence, you might be able to hear your heart beating. You can feel your heart beating. Your body is still breathing. And none of it is because of you. Those things are happening, not because of your movements or your words, but because he holds you together. In this posture, you can be reminded that he is God, so you can just rest. When you sit and do nothing before the Lord, you're reminded that he has saved you, not so that you can do good things or say good things, but because he just wants you. He has saved you for this time right here. And he has looked forward to a moment for you to sit still in the silence, doing nothing, where he can just be near you. This posture is Jesus' invitation for you to cast all of your fears, all of your burdens, all of your to-do list on him. It's his invitation to hear the quiet voice of the Father who is telling you, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter. I delight in you, not for the work that you do, not for the things that you say, but because I have made you and I love you. Silence is Jesus' invitation to be reminded of who he is, that he is God, and who you are to him. Okay. That's the third point. So silence reveals hidden things in us. Silence helps us hear quiet things. And silence ultimately is just a posture to, to remind us this is the beauty of the gospel. This is what you've done to make your life great. Nothing. He does that. He does that work. He came with life abundantly to give it. So how do we practice this? <clears throat> it's an acronym, but I want you to just consider in the next week practicing getting still. S-T-I-L-L. -L, getting still. Practice getting still. It will look different for all of you because you're in different stages of life. If you're a mother with young children and babies, please don't take this as like, do you think I could possibly have time to do that? I promise, I recognize that you have a very different situation um, than mine, and I have uh, grace for, for that and understanding in that, in that particular regard. But if you can find space in your world uh, at home to do this, I would just encourage you to do that. But practice of getting still. Here's what it stands for. One, find a space. S stands for space. Find a space, just a room, um, a, maybe even walking, a park, something, a space that's just distraction-free. There are universal sounds that you'll hear, like you might hear your kids in the other room or something like that. Uh, you might hear cars and dogs barking or whatever. Um, but find a space that's, that's pretty much, there's no TV, you're, you're a space that's distraction-free. And then find a time. Find a time that's most consistent for you, something that you can keep doing, not one that you have to fight for. So if there's a space and time that works, and it's like this is consistently empty and free of distraction, this time works for me. And then find something that's interruption free. So remove music. Don't, don't do this with music on. Don't do this with your phones near you, where you can hear, even if you silence it, you can hear the buzz of it or something like that, or even see the light click on or something like that. But interruption-free, background noise, nothing like that. And then pick a length. Set a goal that's challenging but doable. And so my encouragement is, if you've never done this, try three minutes. Now, try five minutes. If you're feeling bold, try 10 minutes or, or, or beyond, but just to sit in the silence. Um, don't do like an hour. Don't do something that you actually won't do. And if you're like, I, I want to start running, so I'm going to do a marathon. It's like, well, you're never going to do that, so don't do that. Um, start small and build your way up. Set a length. Um, and then set a timer so, so you have it. And I don't know how you want to do that, but just somehow you know that you have a timer going that will go off. And then I want you to listen. That's it. You're sitting there seeking silence to listen to the Lord. And listen for three things. 
Listen to what your mind and your heart are revealing to you. What is being revealed in the silence? What can you not stop thinking about? That is not a distraction to be discouraged by. That is something that the Holy Spirit is looking at and going, give that one to me. You can't stop thinking about it, so give it to me. So many people, when I, when, I, when I talk to them about praying or something like that, like I get so distracted when I go silent to pray. And it's like, those are not distractions. Those are your prayers. You should just take those things to him. Don't be distracted and discouraged by them. Take those things and make them prayers to your father who actually really loves that you think about those things all the time because he wants to take them. So listen to what's revealed in you. Listen for God's voice. Ask him again like Samuel. I am your servant. Speak. I am listening. Listen for God's voice. If a verse comes to your mind, that's God speaking. And go, why is that verse coming to my mind? Process it. Chew on it. Have it in your mind. Say it quietly to yourself. And then listen to the silence and the stillness. Enjoy the beauty of the gospel. Remind, let yourself be reminded that this is what I do to make my life what I want it to do. He does everything and I do nothing. This is how all of my, my greatest battle in the world against sin, I had nothing to do with defeating. He did it all, and I did nothing. And so for the battles that I'm facing today, this is still my greatest posture and the best way to fight, to do nothing and to ask him to do everything. Because if he took on your greatest challenge, these smaller ones are no big deal either. But listen, don't be discouraged if you find it difficult. Of course, it's going to be difficult. That's what practice is. Practice is difficult. The, the idea is that to pursue Jesus in this, this way, he's pleased even with that. C.S. Lewis has that idea. It's like even in our stumbles, God is pleased with us. And we're seeking to spend time with him as the goal and the idea. And so my encouragement to you is to practice getting still. Find a space, a time that's interruption-free, set a length, and then just listen to the voice of your father. I encourage you to do that. If you're in our community group, um, in the small group time that you have with your group, I actually included this practice in there. I'd love for you all to do that together. You don't have to separate or be apart from each other. You can just do that together as a group. But I'd love for you to practice this together. My encouragement to you, practice silence. This spiritual practice that is very antiquated, but it's current and, and needed um, and necessary for today. It's vital for our spiritual life. When you do it, you'll hear the voice of your Father. You'll learn to do that, to cast your cares on Him, and to be reminded at the end of the day that like, He cares for you. And this is where He wants you, just to spend time with you, because He loves you. So practice silence. Let me pray. Father, what a beautiful invitation for us to do nothing before you so that we can ultimately experience that it is not our work that makes you love us. It is not our words that make you love us. You created us and made us. You've pursued us and saved us. And you just long to spend time with your children the way that we love to spend time with our children. And so God, I pray that as we move forward in this week that you would give us a hunger and a desire just for the silence, for it not to be an awkward space, but to be a space where you're able to reveal the things in us that you want to carry because they're far too heavy for us. And so God, I pray that you would do that, that you would meet us in these spaces, that we would learn to hear the quiet voice of our Father. Would you do that in Jesus' name? Amen.